footing. And Sophie, the stage is yours. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm excited to tell you about this proof. It's joint work with Maria Trudnovsky, Alex Scott, and Paul Seymour. And it's a proof where I really can either tell you everything or nothing. So I've opted for everything. And I will try to actually convince you that it's true during this talk, which means you're allowed to ask me questions at any time. If something doesn't make sense, if you don't believe it, please interrupt me. I am trying to actually give you the details and convince you that it works. And to that end, the slides are also on my website. So if you want to look up something from another part of the talk, you can find the slides there. All right, so let me start. I'm going to do the introduction very quickly because the proof is long and I want to tell you as much of this as I can. This is about induced subgraphs. If we have a big graph G, then a little graph H is an induced subgraph of G if we can get from G to H by only deleting vertices. So it's stronger than being a sub graph because in a subgraph you can also delete edges, but here you cannot. And so when I say H-free, I always mean does not contain H as an induced subgraph. And the Erdős Heinel conjecture is one of the most intriguing answers we have to the question, what do H-free graphs look like? Here's the full conjecture. And for the purposes of this talk, we'll look at one specific version of it, but they're all equivalent where we'll say a class of graphs has the Erdős Heinel property if there's some positive constant such that every graph in the class satisfies alpha times omega as at least number of vertices in G to the C, where alpha is the size of the largest stable set. Thank you, you actually found the slides and posted them into the chat. So if anyone's looking for them, all right, alpha is the size of the largest stable set and omega is the size of the largest clique. And this is equivalent to the version where we say the max of the two. And the conjecture just says that for every graph H, the class of H free graphs has the Erdős Heinel property. And here is a very brief and probably incomplete history of what we know about this conjecture. So the kind of first and easy graphs to prove this conjecture for are graphs that don't contain a complete graph. That's just a consequence of the bounds we get for Ramsey's theorem. The next thing are P4-free graphs, which are perfect. And then Alan Pach solimosi proved that if there is a graph H such that H-free graphs have the Erdős Heinel property, then we can also substitute such graphs into each other to obtain new graphs H so that those that H-free graphs for those H still have the Erdős Heinel property. The next result was bull-free graphs. And then there was a series of results about excluding something in its complement that was started by Buske, Lagood, and Thomasy for pans, and then was improved to hooks, which are pans with one more vertex, and then to caterpillars, and finally to all forests. And so in this talk, I will tell you about these new results, and really, I will only tell you about the first one and maybe give you a few ideas about the other ones. And now I'm actually going to start the proof already. So here's a basic outline of the proof, and I highlighted in yellow the words that at this point do not make sense. And we'll go through this, and throughout the talk I'll explain what we're actually doing. The way the proof works is we take G, which is a minimal counterexample for some C. Remember, C is the size of alpha times omega we're trying to look at. And we say n is its number of vertices, and it doesn't have C5. Now, first, we'll go to a subset of a linear number of vertices such that G on that subset is sparse. And I haven't tell, told you what sparse means or why we can do that, but I will. And then we'll do an iterative procedure where we start at x, and that'll be our ambient set. Then we pick a vertex vi. We start at v1, and we keep going such that VI is a vertex of largest degree within the ambient set we're currently looking at. 
then look at the VI and its neighbors and find a maximum stable set among the neighbors of VI, call it CI. So CI is in here and it's a stable set. Then look at the neighbors of CI that are not neighbors of VI. And after we're done with this, delete everything that we just defined and then do it again in what remains. And so this way we'll slowly eat up pieces of X by deleting vertices with V, their neighbors, their set CI, and the set of neighbors of CI over here. And there's one step here where I said, for this set, we actually do two different things. If it's small, we delete it and continue. And if it's large, we will find a comb which I have not told you what that means, but it will mean that we win in another way that is not iterating this procedure. And finally, when we're done, you'll have noticed that when we pulled out the set CI, we deleted all of its neighbors. So the set CI are stable sets with no edges between them. So our hope is that, you know, if we can do this procedure lots of times, then we actually get a lot of set CI that are all fairly big. So their union is still pretty big and we will win. And again, I haven't explained why we actually win in this case. So this is the basic setup. And now I'll slowly go through all the actual meanings of the steps I just told you. First, we're going to prove the additional conjecture for some constant C. And throughout this proof, there will be constants. And when there are constants in a proof like this, it's always a worry that they will be circular. So here's the rule for the constants. We will pick epsilon. Delta will be given to us, and then we will pick C in this order. So when we pick epsilon, we must not have known C yet, but when we pick C, we can look at what epsilon and delta are. And now if we pick a minimum counterexample with n vertices, then that means that alpha times omega for G is less than n to the C, but for every proper subset of the vertex set, the conjecture holds and the graph is C5 free. This is the setup. And now the first step I mentioned before is let's go from a big graph to a big piece that's sparse. And sparse is actually not a very strong sparsity, but in fact, sparse parameterized by epsilon just means that the neighborhood of every vertex is at most an epsilon fraction of the ambient graph, right? So this just means the degree is only a small linear fraction of the whole graph, but it doesn't mean any kind of strong sparsity you might be used to. But there's a beautiful theorem of Rodel's that says for every graph H and epsilon, there is some delta such that every n vertex H for graph G contains an induced subgraph J, which is large. It contains a linear proportion of the vertices of G and either J or its complement is epsilon sparse. So if we have a huge H free graph, then it has a linear sized chunk and this chunk is sparse or dense. Now, since C5 is self-complementary, if J happens to be dense, we just go to the complement of J. It'll still be C5 free. And the, if G is a mineral counterexample, so is the complement of G because everything we said is actually invariant under taking complements. So in this step, it is fair for us to assume that J is in fact sparse. And this is consistent with the constants I told you. We pick epsilon, we're given delta. And later in the proof, we will pick epsilon and we will be given delta. But for now, I'm not going to tell you what they are. Thank you, Sophie. Um, I have a question just yes. to uh, clarify. So this lemma in the contrapositive says basically if, um, if every subset has some reasonable density, so not like zero or one, then you can find a copy of your given graph age. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. yeah, this is proved as an application of the regularity lemma. So what you said fits with that way of thinking about it, right? If all the densities are normal, then we can embed pretty much anything we want. And otherwise there are lots of them that are big or small. And so we get this outcome, which means then Delta usually depends on epsilon in a rather awful way, but we don't care. 
And right, so that's the set X. X is just J or J complement if we had to go to the complement. It has size at least delta N and maximum degree epsilon times X. Which means we did the first step, we went to a sparse graph. So now let me tell you about combs. Combs are one of the tools that are new here and that really worked. They came from a paper of Pach and Tomon and we used and refined their lemma to make this work. So a comb is what this picture shows, but let me go through it. We have a TK comb in AB, which means that we have T rows in this picture and the sets over here have size K each. And these are from a set of vertices called A and these are from a set of vertices called B, where these guys are all distinct. These guys are all disjoint. And also the edges are as drawn where I'm only saying stuff about edges that are not vertical. So each AI is adjacent to every vertex in its BI. None of these diagonal edges are present, but there can be edges within this set and there can be edges within these sets and also between these sets. It just says something about diagonal and horizontal edges. This is something like every AI has like that private set of neighbors. Yes, yeah. right. And we'll see in a second how this helps us find C5 in most situations. But so right, this is, no. yes, go ahead. So you can't go from A1 to B4. Right, it just can never go okay. diagonal. Yes, good point. My picture makes it look like they're only consecutive, but in fact, no diagonal edges are present all horizontal edges are present and I am not telling you either way what happens with edges that are only on the left or only on the right. And so if we go back to the sketch of the proof, which I just brought up again, but nothing changed. When we find a comb in this proof, it'll actually be a comb where the AIs are in my set CI, so they are in here and the B sets are out there which I'm only saying to make the point that when we find a comb, we'll actually have VI, which is adjacent to all of the AIs and none of the Bs. And also A will be a stable set. So even though I didn't require that the AIs have no edges between them, since we pulled them out of a stable set, it will be true anyway. Which means that when we get a comb, and I copied this picture here so you can see what's happening, we have VI, we have these AI, which come from CI, which is a stable set, and we have the B sets, which means that if we find a comb in this proof, then an edge like this between one B set and another B set cannot exist. Because if I have this edge, then I just drew this over here. We know that VI is adjacent to the A sets because they come from here and not adjacent to the B sets, which come from here. And moreover, we just said no diagonal edges. And also the A's come from the stable set, so there's no edge here. So whenever we get a comb, we'll actually have the additional property that there are no edges between the B sets. So basically from now on, you can forget what a comb is and just remember if we have a comb, we will never have edges between the B sets. There can still be edges within each of these sets. So I'm not saying anything about that, just about edges that go between any distinct two of these. And that's helpful because if you think about this, this looks like a good candidate for induction. We have these B sets, which are slightly big sets, hopefully, and there are no edges between them. So let's see which sizes of B sets would actually be enough. We have a TK comb, meaning we have T sets and each has size at least K. Then we know that each of the sets BI is actually a proper subset of the vertex set of G. So none of them is a counter example. So if I look at each of these sets and just look in here, 
I know that here alpha times omega is at least the size of b1 to the c, which is k to the c, which can be rewritten as saying that alpha within bi is at least k to the c over omega of g, where we replaced omega of bi by omega of g because making it bigger makes this only more true. So each of these has a stable set of this size, k to the c over omega, which means that if we take all these stable sets, since there are no edges between them, g has a stable set of size t times what we get within each bi. And that means that alpha of g times omega of g is at least t times k to the c which since we have a counter example should be less than n to the c. So n to the c should be bigger than alpha times omega, which we just proved is at least t times k to the c. And this can be rewritten as that. Why am I telling you all of this? Because this shows us that whenever we have a minimum counter example and in the course of this proof find a comb, we can immediately conclude this about the numbers in the comb which is also written behind me, so you don't have to remember it. But then I forgot that sunlight only exists during the day, so you can only kind of see it. But I highlight it again for you. This is one of the two things you will need to remember temporarily throughout this proof. For every TK comb we ever find, we can always conclude that this relationship holds between the numbers K and T. Exciting. So where do combs come from? Here's where combs come from. We're going to look at just a bipartite graph because I only care about the edges between A and B for all of this comb finding business. Right, so let us look at a bipartite graph with the bipartition AB. And I want to assume that every vertex of A has a neighbor in B. Right, in our application, that'll be true because A will be CI and B will actually just be its neighbor. So that is going to work out. And then I also want D to be the max degree of vertices in A, just their degree to B. And I want to conclude that either B is small, where I didn't fill this in because the numbers are horrible, but I'll tell you after the proof. And the other outcome is that there is a TK comb where this holds, but if you remember the previous slide, we can assume that that never happens. So we'll actually use this lemma to prove that whenever we have these assumptions, B is small. And the way you can think of this in you know, the grand picture of the proof is that if we look at the set CI, we're looking at how it expands within the ambient set. And if it doesn't expand very much, we will delete it and its neighbors and then repeat that procedure. And so hopefully we'll get a lot of big sets CI with no edges between them. On the other hand, if it expands very much, we will find a beautiful cone that either gives us a C5 or gives us the large stable set we wanted from induction. Um, hi, you probably said it, but the neighborhood of A is the union of the vertex neighborhoods. Yes, yes, good point. Thank you. Yes, this just means every vertex in B should have at least one neighbor in A. All right, so this procedure is a bit finicky. It basically comes down to the fact that if you have a set of vertices and a set of neighbors, is much bigger than the set of neighbors of a single vertex in that set, then we can un, well, uncross things and turn it into a comb. So this will be a procedure for taking advantage of this property. And what we'll do is we'll collect vertices in A and delete their neighbors from B in order to reduce the maximum degree from A to B by a factor of two. So I made a picture for this. Here's what we're doing. We're defining sets A1, A2, and so on. And what we do for A1 is we know every vertex in A has at most D neighbors in B. 
as long as there is somebody with at least d over two neighbors here, we're going to add it to a1. Now here's a1 and we remove its neighbors from b and just look at the rest. If somebody still has d over two neighbors in the rest, we add him to a1 and add his neighbors to up here and keep going and keep going and keep going until eventually we filled a1 as much as we can and look at its neighbors and then in its non-neighbors, every vertex now has at most d over two neighbors because if it had more, it would have gone in a1. And so now later we're gonna say either the set is small or we will find a comb in there just with a1. But now this is the first step where we reduce max degree from d to d over two. Let's do it again. So in a2, as long as somebody has at least d over four neighbors down here, add into a2. And now remove all neighbors of a1 and a2 from consideration. If somebody still has at least d over four neighbors down here, add them to a2 again. And do that while you can do that. And once we're doing, once we're done doing that, everyone who still has neighbors down here has at most d over four. As we keep doing that, the requirement for number of neighbors keeps going down until at some point when we're after log n or so steps. It's enough to just have one new neighbor. And at that point, we will add vertices to the corresponding A set until every vertex in B has a neighbor in one of the A sets. Which means that once this is done, every vertex in B will end up in one of these sets that I have outlined here. And for each of them separately, we'll argue that it either is small or gives us a comb. So to do that, let me call XL the set of new neighbors of AL. So X1 was this set, X2 is this set, X3 is the set of neighbors we get from A3 that weren't neighbors of A1 or A2, and so on. And then as we discussed, B is the union of all of these sets. Let me number the vertices in AL in the order we added them. Each time we added a vertex, we know it contributed a lot of new neighbors because that's our criterion for adding it, which means the order of these things matters. Now, we want to find a comb between AL and XL. In order to do that, note that we did a construction which meant that at the step for XL, each vertex actually only had d over two to the L minus one neighbors or less in XL, because if it had more, we would have instead added V to AL minus one. And also for each vertex XJ that we did add to AL, it brought a lot of new neighbors according to this criterion. So it's starting to look a little comb-like. Right, we have X1, it's got a good number of new neighbors it brought in, then X2 brought in a good number of new neighbors, then X3, right? This is just from one step from one AL with L fixed. Each new vertex brought in a good number of new neighbors. So it's looking very comb-like, except there are edges possible in this direction. Right, let me call N1 the neighbors of X1 and N2 the neighbors of X2 that aren't neighbors of X1 and so on. Then by defining in this way, I guarantee that there are never edges sloped downward in this picture. And we may have edges sloped upwards and I wanna get rid of them. And if I get rid of them, I will have a comb. How do we get rid of them? Well, we do a procedure that I wrote here in words, but I think it's nicer to see it in a picture. How it works is we start at the other end, we look at the largest xi, and we say, call this a1, call its set of neighbors, this was its n set, its set of new neighbors, call this b1. But then let me record its neighbors along and just sloped upwards and let me call them band if they occur in other sets bi. 
then move up one, go to X2, look at B2, and assess how many vertices in B2 are banned. If a lot of them, at least this many, are banned, we'll discard it. But here you can see that only a few are banned and most of them are not. So we say X2 is going to be our A2, and this will be B2, just the good vertices, not the bad ones. And now its neighbors along upward edges are also called band. Then when we get to X1, we say, well, it looks like a lot of its neighbors are banned, so let's discard this one. And then we don't mark its neighbors upwards to be banned because we just forget that row, it's no good. While I haven't presumably convinced you of any of the numbers, on this slide, just check that we don't have diagonal edges anymore because each time we had a diagonal edge, we called these vertices band. And each time we made a B set, we didn't keep any of the band vertices. So this does make a comb. And now we're gonna check the numbers. And most of these slides, the numbers are just copied over from the previous slide, so you don't have to go back and forth. Can I just ask a question? Yes. Because I, I think I got a little bit lost because I was writing. Um, so can you just go through the procedure again? So you have your X eyes and your, and your neighbors that you find by picking majority one after the other. Then you discard the bad vertices in a BI and you start from the bottom, maybe? Yes. Yeah, you start from the bottom. So, and, but then you have some BIs that are very small or nothing left. Yes, right. And then so, you just delete the row. Yes. Okay, I got it, okay, thanks. Yes, yes, but the important, this is a good clarification because the important point is that things here are only called banned if they were neighbors of somebody I did not discard. Yeah. Which means that each time I have a bad vertex, it's also evidence that there was something in a previous step I kept. So we have some trade-off going on that'll tell us that actually we keep a good amount of stuff. Uh, so I start from the bottom. I say something is bad. And if the remaining, say the B2 is too small, I just delete, do I delete the bottom one or do I delete the two, the row two? So if this is small, you delete X2 and you delete B2. Yeah, okay. And then this set wouldn't be called band because it can only be called band if it was neighbor. Yeah. From the okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. This is a bit complicated. So it's good that you asked because it's weird to look at it at first. It's basically just a greedy procedure for trying to get rid of bad inches. And it works because for each vertex, its degree is actually comparable to the size of the set. So each time we keep something, the amount that becomes banned is actually comparable to what we keep. And each time we toss something, the amount that's banned is also comparable to what we kept. So there is a, we basically toss only a constant amount, which I'll say more carefully in a second. So, at this point, I made a note because there's a lot of information, but I just want to check the numbers of the comb we got, just the size of the comb. And so we built a comb from this procedure. It has some number T of sets and our rules send each NJ had size at least D over two to the L. And if half of them are banned, we discard xj. So each time we discarded xj, it had d over two to the l private band vertices. Meaning since I discarded x1, there were many band vertices that were in n1 that were therefore bad only for x1 and not for anybody else. And on the other hand, each time we kept xj, it made all its neighbors up band, but since a lot of its neighbors are already in NJ, there are actually not that many new band vertices. And if you don't exactly believe the powers of two, that's perfectly fine because that's just a constant factor. 
if you want to and in strength powers to make yourself more convinced it's fine here it will not actually affect the outcome but assuming you believe these numbers if we're counting bad vertices then it's at most t times d over 2 to the l because t is the number of things we kept and each time we kept something we made at most d over 2 to the l things bad but also the number of discarded vertices compares with bound vertices because each time we discarded a vertex, it had d over 2 to the l private band neighbors. So the number of bad vertices is also at least this, which either you can take my explanation for that these are comparable, or you can actually follow the steps in these computations that prove that 3t is at least al. In other words, al had a certain number of vertices and at least a third of them survived in the cone. Which basically has to do with the fact that this number is twice that number. Each time we kept something, we made twice as many things banned as we cached in each time we deleted something. So the number of things we keep is at least half the number of things we throw away. So now we're going to use this to prove something about the size of XL. Right, we get a cone with these parameters. We just convince ourselves this, that T is AL over 3, and this is the size of the B sets. And as I asked you to remember, for every TK cone we get, we can always assume that this is in fact not true. That's what it says on my board, or it would say it if you could read it. So what does that mean? Well, let's plug in the numbers. K is at least n t to the minus 1 over c, which we took to the power c here. And then we moved this to the other side and moved all of this to the other side. So this is a cone, a big cone, a cone that will get as a c5 or get as a channel if al is at least this size which means, and I'm sliding this over manually on purpose so you can check my answer. Since we can assume that a TK comb never satisfies this, we can in fact assume the opposite of this inequality, which is that inequality, which kind of looks like a horrible formula, but we're going to make it better, though not right away. But so this is the size of AL. And if this number doesn't mean anything to you right now, that's perfectly fine. It'll come together to a number that does mean something when we're done. But this tells us that AL is small in some sense. That depends on L. And recall how we built this thing, right? A1 were vertices with at most D neighbors. And then we deleted their neighbors. So now in A2, everyone had at most D over two neighbors which means that if we're looking at XL, which as you recall, were the neighbors of AL that were new for AL, it's at most the number of vertices in AL times the number of neighbors of each search vertex, which is this. And remember how I said we would prove that B is small, but the numbers would be horrible. Here you go. B is the union of the sets XL and we just said each set XL is at most AL times D to over 2 to the L minus 1, which this part is copied here. And then the size of AL is this horrible formula you see here. We're getting closer there to the proof, though. It's This is the most horrible part, or at least the second most horrible part, I promise. All right. This term I'm teaching intro to combinatorics. So basically the only tool we're learning the first half of the semester is the geometric series. This, if you're not too demotivated by the horrible constants in it, has L in the exponent of various numbers. This is a geometric series. So if you move all this stuff to places where it doesn't bother you actually figuring out what the geometric series evaluates to, 
you will conclude that it's this. Which makes sense, right? There is some stuff that has L on the exponent, which are basically just twos. So if we evaluate the geometric series, there should just be some horrible constant that has twos in it. And indeed, there you go. And the remainder is three times n to the c times d to the one minus c. It's quick math, but in this case, I checked it and it should actually be true. All right, so this is the size of B, which is why I didn't put it the first time I told you that we were about to prove this. But also if you think about the proof, we get to choose C and if I let C go to zero, this goes to one, this goes to three, and this goes to a half, so this goes to six, which means that if I promise you that C will be a small constant that we can make as small as we want, we can replace this horrible number by seven. And that's the second thing you would see on my board if I had understood how light works when I wrote the board. But please recall that the size of B is at most this, and I will tell you where in the proof we will use this. But this is the main step, right? We get a comb. The reason we get a comb is mostly a lot of drawn out computations I just walked you through, which is why I just walked you through them. This is really the heart of the proof. Unfortunately, it is a bit detail heavy. Now, where does B go? If you remember my picture at the beginning, B was this part. We find a comb in AB and B was this thing. So now I'm going to replace this because we never get a big comb. Right, there were two cases. This the set B is large or this the set B is small. But now we already did the part where it's large. So now I'm going to put that it's small, which means B is going to be at most seven times some stuff, which are the numbers I asked you to remember. So now we can assume that B is at most this, and D was the maximum degree from B to A, from A to B, sorry, the max degree from A to B, which means since VI was a vertex of max degree, we can estimate this max degree in the bipartite graph by the degree of VI. And, and you're promising me that this is the real N from the whole graph, not of the induced thing you're looking at. Okay. Yes. I trust you. Yes, the reason it's the whole n, right, is because the way it came into this proof is mm -hmm. because we assumed that it was a counterexample, which let us assume this for all terms. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that n is actually this n. Okay. But you are very right to be suspicious about the step of going to a linear size subgraph. And just for this, I have made this slide, which is called the end, even though it's the second to last slide, just to you know, give you hope here. It's almost done. We're getting through it. So now is the part where we pay for the fact that we went to a linear size subgraph. And these computations look like a mess, but I tried to make them as simple as possible. If you recall, we pick VI and we delete their neighbors and CI and its neighbors and so on until we ate up half of X. So when we're done with this, the amount we deleted was at least half x. And now b is small basically says something about how the amount we deleted compares to other stuff. Since what we deleted was the neighbors of vi and the neighbors of ci, I can now look at its size the neighbors of ci, this was the set bi from the slide before. So we can estimate it by this seven times a lot of stuff. The neighborhood of vi is at most, this is the closed neighborhood because I'm including vi and I'm estimating it to be at most twice the neighborhood of vi because if you have a linear size set of vertices with max degree zero, I hope that you will believe me that this is true. And this twice the neighborhood of VI, we can replace by twice this because it's an 
arithmetic mean. Right here we have this with exponent one, and now we have something with total exponent one where we replace part of the factor by a bigger number. And the end of the whole graph is bigger than the neighborhood of any one vertex. So this only made it bigger, which means putting these together, the amount we deleted in each step was at most nine times this. And now, a bunch of calculations having to do with the fact that we're in a linear size subgraph. This is another way to write that the size of X is at least delta N, which means we can now put stuff together. First, let's look at this half. This half I claim is gotten from the top by dividing by nine X. We have this sum and we know each summand is at most nine times this. So if we divide each sum in by nine times X, we lose this part, this part stays, here it is, and we're dividing by X. If we divide X over two by nine X, we get one over 18. And now we're going to do this arithmetic mean. Well, we're actually gonna replace just part of this. Right, we can write this x as x to the one minus c times x to the c. And then we will replace n to the c over x to the c by delta to the minus c. And I'm fully aware that in this talk, you will have no way of confirming if I'm applying all the inequalities the right way. But I looked over this slide a number of times and I'm pretty sure it's true. All right. This looks horrible, why did we do that? Well, later we're gonna weigh this, right? Which is basically this saying the sets B are small, the sets C I don't expand very much. We're gonna weigh this against the sizes of the CI to say the sets C I are big. And here's one last simplification. We're gonna do an arithmetic mean again, because here, we have this quotient to the power one minus C. And now of this exponent, I'm gonna take one minus two C and replace this number by epsilon, which is bigger. Right, we know that X is epsilon sparse. So the neighborhood as a quotient of X for any vertex is at most epsilon. So I'm only making the side bigger by replacing part of this term by epsilon instead of this first quotient. All right. Now, this joined us on the next slide here, but I'm leaving it half scrolled so you can verify. We certainly kept this stuff. We kept one over 18 and then delta to the minus C went to the other side and the epsilon also went to the other side. And this is actually the last slide, so. Now we're gonna find out how big the sets C, I, and R. They have no edges between them because we deleted their neighbors in each step. And they were maximum stable sets in the neighbors of V, I, which means that because it's a minimum counter example, we know that they are big. They have size at least number of neighbors of V, I over clique number of G. So, if I take alpha of G times omega of G, I could also take the sum of the sizes of CI times omega of G, which I could estimate by the sum over these things, which tells me that in G alpha times omega is at least this sum. This just comes from applying induction to the neighbors of VI. And this is at most N to the C because we have a counterexample. Now, let's apply a bunch of our tricks to this inequality again. Over can here, I, yes. Can, I, can you maybe show your picture again with the CIs and the neighborhoods just to? Yes. Do I actually have a copy of it? Yes, should have probably kept one there. So um, here's CI. Was this the one you meant? 
Yeah, 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 that's the picture. So you, you're starting somewhere, you look in the neighborhood, you find your largest independent set, you look at the neighbors outside, by find, you find your comb somehow, and then, yeah, and then you do this thing that either the comb is big, then there must be some edge there, so I find my C5, or it's small, and then I just continue in the rest, and I just add up all of these independent sets, and that's where you get your sums, and you prove that, well, the sum of this can't be so big, because, well, must go one way or the other, because I have a count example. Yes, okay, cool. yeah. that's exactly right. So Thank we you. use the comb because the size of the comb actually is in some way comparable with the size of B, yep. via this horrible formula that we proved. So right, this is exactly right in the good summary, probably to say at this point, because combs are small, each CI does not expand very much in the graph. So each time we keep CI, we basically trade it for the set B. So if that trade, if CI doesn't expand very much, that trade isn't very expensive. So we get to keep a good amount of stable set and only use a small amount of graph in a way that gives us the horrible equations that you're about to see. Right, so this is where we apply induction. And this is then saying that the union of the CI is small, which will in a second contradict this other statement we got from saying the CI don't expand very much on the previous slide. So this, we take this thing and divide it by X to the C. That gives us this. And over here gives us N to the C divided by X to the C. And then if we apply this, and I promise I applied it the right way, even though I also have to check it in my head every time. We can estimate this by delta to the minus C. So now, even though they didn't look very related, we have two inequalities that are about this quantity. This first one says it's at most delta to the C, and this one says it's at least this stuff. So by comparing these two inequalities, this one saying the CI are small, and this one coming from the CI don't expand very much. We get this nice, beautiful, neat little formula, right? Delta to the minus C is at least this stuff. So if I take one delta to the C to the other side, I get that delta to the minus two C is bigger than this. And recall at the very beginning, we pick epsilon, we're given delta, and then we pick C. Let's pick epsilon to be one over 20. We're given some number delta, and now we pick C, but as C goes to zero, this goes to one over epsilon, so it goes to 20, which means this side goes to 10 over nine. And this goes to, the exponent goes to zero, so this just goes to one, which means this side goes to one, and this side goes to a number bigger than one. So there is some C, some really, really tiny C somewhere, where this is formed, which is a contradiction. And the contradiction is on our statement that we assume G is a minimal counter example. All right, you made it through the proof. Everything I will say from here on out will not have horrible equations. But also, if you want to ask questions now, I would be more than happy to answer them. Thank you, Sophie. Let's uh, unmute and thank the speaker. Thank you so much. Um, questions, please. Uh, um, so, so just one um, general question. Uh, it's a pretty major step in the proof, it seems, where you use the fact that C5 is self-complementary and looking at all the uh, classes of graphs that have been proved. Um, you know, when you've got single graphs, except for the complete graphs, when you've got single graphs, they're all self-complementary. Uh, and when there are pairs of graphs, you've got a graph and it's complement or a graph and something similar is complement. 
Uh, is there any hope of doing something significant with a graph like, say, C6 alone? Not at this moment. The problem is that, right, we have this step like you noticed in the beginning of going to the complement. And so far, we are not good enough at finding stuff that's sparse in a dense graph or stuff that's dense in a sparse graph, which is why these self complementary things really work well. But yeah, for right. example, yeah, so can you explain in a nutshell why it works and with, with the complete sub, with the complete graph? So KT, uh, right? It, 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 there's a proof for that. Yes. But it's not self complementary. <laughs> yes, but it's somehow, it's not this kind of proof, it's just Ramsey's proof. Yeah. Right? And the problem is that Ida Channel tells you you get a big clique or stable set. But when you exclude a complete graph, you actually don't even get a medium sized clique. Your max clique is really tiny. So from that alone, you get a big stable set. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Like if you exclude a triangle, for example, either some vertex has square root and neighbors. Yeah. And then it's a stable set. Or each vertex has at most square root and neighbors, but then just pick a vertex delete its neighbors, pick a vertex, delete its neighbors. And if you eat all the vertices in the graph, you kept one vertex and deleted square root n. So you kept one over square root n of the vertices, right? But somehow this proof feels very different in flavor to all these other proofs, right? I, I don't have a better answer for okay. why we're so much better at self complementary things. Yeah, it's a, it's a big, a a big uh, kind of a, a major step you can do that uh, that changes the problem. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So maybe in the same vein, what Nick asked, you can say something like this: if you have an age-free graph. Like you don't, you're not as in Adish Heinel, you're trying to prove that there is a large click or independent set, but you're saying there's a large in your subgraph that's H complement three or something like that. I have to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> like in the clique, if you don't have a clique, you find a large induced subgraph that's click free, but it's also, well, it's a lot in, yeah. I'll have to think about what I actually want to say, but maybe changing the statement of Radish Hanel. And that's it, but yeah, never mind. Yeah, maybe on this note, I prepared a slide that actually tells you a little bit more of the story of excluding things and their complements. Because if you push this method a little bit more, we can, get a handful more things out of the um, fact that we're good at sparse and dense graphs. In particular, if I have a graph with star expansion is basically what you get here from sticking a cone to it, right? Like if P4 is here, then it's star expansion is the graph where you add a leaf on every vertex and then a vertex that's adjacent to all the leaves you just made. And so we get Edit channel for C5 free or C5 with a hat and its complement. And then previously where we could do a tree and its complement, we can now do the star expansion of a tree or the complement of a tree. So actually in the base of the cone, we can do our sparse dense tricks again to get a little more but combs by themselves are hard to use because they don't contain many self-complementary graphs other than C5. For example, the next natural graph to do would be P5 of five vertex path, but then in a sparse graph, we would be mostly concerned with finding its complement, which is this graph, the house. And if you just think back to the pictures of combs you saw in this talk, this does not look like it would be anywhere in them, right? Everything we get from 
going to the vertices A, I, and V, I is somehow growth five stuff, which really doesn't help with this at all. So, yeah, I, it seems like from this method, we try to get about all we can get from it. Thank you. I think I 